now you like the ring. And see this day in school when we fight for our life. Never get a chance to decide. All we do is pay the price. The homies on the corner selling drugs, playing dice. Father going, I stand tall. One day it's gonna be alright. Everybody said they're here for you, but not there on the moon nights. Nice. That's a gamble, and I told myself how to live the right. Used to be a bad kid, all I knew was fight. Got all the things changed, but I can't sacrifice. When I'm from, people die from being nice. Gave too many people chances, they don't want to be nice. They're looking down, they don't know what it's like to walk in our shoes. Cops killing us every night. If you had a chance to see what's wrong, what would you do to make it right? Take some time and decide, cause you can't do it twice. This is me saying I wanted to do whatever, so the Bible was in this life. Three, two, one. As a community, we are, we are engaged in a united struggle to overcome the social, political, economic, educational, and spiritual inequities which threaten to destroy us as a people. We recognize that as young people, we are one of the greatest resources available to the survival of our community. Therefore, we stand ready, willing, and willing, and hereby pledge our commitment to rebuild and improve the quality of life in our community through collective work, responsibility, and cooperative economics to educate, elevate, and raise the consciousness of ourselves and others along the way to develop our potential as leaders and positive and role models so we can proactively pursue justice, equality, and peace for all. All that we do with the appreciation, love, dignity, respect, that the collective will, the collective will of, of the community is the greatest force to see people Thank you. Nice. Thank you. Nice. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay. So, um, welcome everyone. Um, I think it's really important, uh, first of all, that you know where you are. We are uh, meeting, uh, having this event today in the Gay Bar Room, which this is the James Brown African American Room, which was named after a, 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 a wonderful, which was named after a wonderful uh, librarian who worked here in the Newark uh, Public Library to bring African American uh, culture and uh, history here uh, to the Newark Public Library. And um, if you don't know that, you'd be in this room and you won't know the spirit of the person uh, after whom this room was named. Because there's another James Brown, James Brown, we love him too, but we want you to know who the Newark James Brown uh, was. So welcome everyone, my name is Antoinette Richardson, I'm Chief Education Officer in Mayor Baraka's uh, Education Office, and uh, we welcome Lead Charter School here today. Uh, this fireside chat with Mayor Baraka is brought to you by the Mayor's Book Club, and in celebration of Malcolm X's 95th birthday, Malcolm X's autobiography is the fall selection for the Mayor's Book Club. That means that the autobiography of Malcolm X is available at all of our branch libraries and the main library here, free to keep for anyone who lives or works or studies in the city of Newark. So, um, I want to acknowledge everyone who worked so hard to make today happen, the staff at Lee Charter School and Opportunity uh, Youth Network. We have Robert Clark here with us, Mark uh, Comasanas, Bilal Walker, and other staff, the staff at the Newark Public Library, especially Tyson Haley, the communication departments of the City of Newark and the Newark Public Library, uh, Shaki Larkins and Jennifer Fanu from uh, the Mayor's Education Office. And now we will have uh, greetings from the director of the Newark Public Library, Jocelyn Dixon, who is a wonderful partner with the Mayor's Book Club. Ms. Dixon. Good morning. Come on. Good morning. Um, welcome. I'm Jocelyn Bowling Dixon, and I'm so glad you all are here. Um, thank you to the mayor and the mayor's office, um, to Antoinette Richardson. Um, our board, a library board member for selecting library as a, as a site to have this wonderful conversation. Um, students, please don't forget that we are a resource to you. Um, we have, we've been open since September 8th, and we also have a lot of online things for you, especially college prep, um, things that you really want to check out. So check us out at npl.org. I um, also wanted just to say a big shout out to the library staff that helped put this together. We've been just running and racing and making sure everything is right, and I really appreciate your efforts. So a uh, big shout out to Tyson Haley, 
Diego Quintero, Craig Lyons, Kirsten, um, Eric, Jonathan, for helping us put us together on the library's end. Um, and getting the wonderful James Brown um, African American room together. And on that note, I won't keep you too long. You're not here to hear me talk. So um, let's start this conversation. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So Malcolm X is a name that's known to many, known to everyone, but not too many people do what you guys have done, which is take the time to read, to study, and to learn more about someone who, although he passed away over 55 years ago, is a name that still resonates with us and ideas that we still talk about and struggle with. And everything that he did in his time was during the civil rights movement, with all the things that you've heard about that happened, the good things and the bad, the violence and the organizing. So we want to just remember that that was then, this is now, some things are different, some things are the same. And we're left with that catchy, that real catchy uh, title to a speech. The ballot or the book. Kind of tricky, makes you think a lot. And here to talk to you about all of that and more today is our mayor, the mayor of North New Jersey, the Honorable Raz J. Baraka. So, um, first, I just want to say thank you. I'm glad you and your principal and the folks allowed you to be a part of this. And, uh, I read, I might have listened to The Ballad of Bullet when I was young a thousand times. Uh, you know, you can hear it too. I've never really read the speech, but I heard it. And um, so you get a different kind of feel from it. Did, did, are you reading the Autobiography of Malcolm X? How many of you got the book, Autobiography of Malcolm X? None of you have the book? We gotta make sure you get the book. You heard of Malcolm, you know who Malcolm X is though, right? Yes. You know, Malcolm X. Malcolm, just a little context before we get into this speech, you know. Malcolm was born in Omaha, in Nebraska, you know. When I first uh, saw Malcolm X, I wasn't alive, but when I first saw and heard him speak, was on a video, a uh, documentary called Eyes on a Prize. You should check that out. Eyes on a Prize is a very enlightening and, 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 and deep kind of, it's a series, so it's, a, 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 it's long but it's not boring. I watched the documentary when I was like 17, so if I could watch it at that age, because it was really, really, really engaging and the stuff that was going on in there is like, it's different than what you hear about what happened uh, in the civil rights movement and the black power movement and all those things after that. If you watch the Eyes on the Prize, it gives you a clear picture uh, of what, you can actually see what was going on. So you should check that out when you get a chance. And I read the autobiography of Malcolm X when I was in college. So hopefully you'll get to read it before you go to college and um, get an understanding of what that was. And, and, and Malcolm X uh, went through a lot of things that I think some of you uh, are going through. And he went through it and took it all the way to his logical end, which means he wound up in jail, right? He grew up, he found his way to Harlem and was involved in the Harlem underworld. Right, and uh, you know, he finally got arrested and uh, did time and then joined the Nation of Islam in jail. Uh, you know, the, the, the one thing I know about the 60s, you have to understand, you know, both Kennedys were killed, John, John F. Kennedy and his brother, which came later, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King was, was killed in the 60s. So it was a very volatile time period that we're talking about. It was a very volatile time period, not just like people being abused by police that was happening and that's happening now, but leaders that was trying to represent black people were also being killed, right? So that put something else on top of it, right? And so you gotta understand the mindset of the people uh, and what was going on at that time. Malcolm X's father was a part of a organization uh, or, or was affiliated with an organization called the Universal Negro Improvement Association with Marcus Garvey and uh, you probably should read Marcus Garvey and check out Marcus Garvey too. Uh, and uh, you know, he was killed uh, when Malcolm was young. But you'll read that in the autobiography of Malcolm X and you should probably uh, read that. But I wanna start in a very basic way, right? Did you like listening or reading the speech, Ballad of the Bullet? Did you like it? Yes. Somebody tell me why they liked it. Anybody? I can go. Go ahead. The reason why I liked it, because like, 
he really was putting his thought in, um, he was really putting his thought in his story and I can relate to that because many of us go through the struggles in the city of Newark and we all persevere and push through through our obstacles. So by him like telling how he was back then, I really appreciate that. Anybody else? Um, it kind of resonated with me just off the, just the ideal perspective of black nationalism. Right. Us being together as a community. That's where it really resonated. I'm gonna come back to that. Go ahead. Uh, I like it because like, we all know history repeating itself right now. So a lot of us can relate to it. All the protesting and voting like that. What, 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 is, what is black nationalism? What, what is that? Because that was like a theme in the speech, you think? You agree that's a theme in the speech? That it, it, it reoccurred over and over again, the idea of black nationalism? What is that? The power of us being black to come together as a community and not even in the case, just uphold each other, but support each other. To support each other. You think that that's, that happens now, that we support each other or don't support you? You think that happens now? That we support each other? In some cases, it do. Go ahead, you first. I don't really feel as though like we support each other to the fullest. Uh -huh. I feel like blacks turn against blacks sometimes. It, it like, can you, you elaborate on what she's saying? Basically, she was saying how um, blacks turning against blacks, meaning like there's like obstacles in which <clears throat> black people do like, say for example, if I have a business and then he has a business and he making more money than, than me, then I'm gonna be mad and wanna take down what he got just by being jealous. I feel as though, I, I feel as though like the black community, like we help each other to a certain extent, but our problem is like we can't put our pride to the side. Like we gotta feel, it's just that, it's just the instinct that we have and we don't know how to like control it. It's like a leadership instinct that we have and we don't, got, we don't put it in the right place at the right times and we don't know how to use it, you feel me, for the right things. So we fighting for leadership or in charge? We're, yeah, in charge. charge. Like everybody yeah. want to be that, they want to have that ball spot, you feel me? But everybody can't have that spot. Everybody got to right. play their role. Martin Luther King called it the drum major instinct. We want to be in the front. Like, you know, the drum major with the, that's what he called it, the drum major instinct. But I think that happens in many communities, actually. I want to get really into the specifics of why we believe and what's causing black people to feel specifically uh, a certain way about one another. Yeah. Um, it's like everybody feel like they're in competition with each other. So like, who gonna get, it, get to the top? So like, hey, personally me, I feel like everybody at each other's neck because they're not, as a community, everybody's for self. So it's like everybody trying to fight to the top instead of let's get this together, let's build this together as a team, but every, like, everybody want their own, so it's like everybody at each other next to get to the top. But not noticing that you've knocking down your own black bin businesses, not trying to work together. So how are we gonna build and improve if we all battling each other? That sounds like capitalism. But do you think that black people support black businesses, period, before you even get into no. people competing with I, each other? I think they do. Huh? I think they support, like black people support other people's businesses. Black people businesses. Like when? Uh, uh, name, name, name a business you think people support. Um, clothing brands. Like what? Uh, Trap Park. Like, it's a clothing huh? brand called Trap Park. Mm. They support it. Well, anything that you do, like if you're a rapper coming from New York and you black, everybody gonna support you. It don't matter. Okay. I, mean, I feel like that support there, but it's just hatred overpowered. You feel me? Say that, I don't understand. The hatred overpowered. Yeah, what, what do you mean by that? Like, um, like just people don't want to see you winning. Like, it just, they like it when it first start off, but once they see like you could really go somewhere with it, that's when that hatred start to show up, you feel me? And it overpower the love. Hmm. Negative always over, overpower the positive, even if it's a little bit of it, you feel me? I don't know about that one. I'm gonna have to get back to that, the negative overpowering the positive. Go ahead. Uh, nah, I disagree. Uh -huh. Like, I'll give you an example. Like, if it's a Puerto Rican store and it's a black store that come before it, people will walk right past and go to that Puerto Rican store and spend the money there instead of spending it with the black owner. Or even like clothes, like you said clothes. Like, for example, 
somebody would walk past an up and coming store that's black owned and go shop at Gucci, Louis Vuitton, all that. So I disagree. I mean, everybody different. Everybody don't do that. You know I mean? Some people, most people do do that. You're right. I agree with him. Anybody else want to jump on that? Do we support businesses that are, you know, so if there was a, a sneaker store, like look at all of the clothes you got on, that all of us are wearing, right? The pocketbooks you buy, all of the stuff that you have, you know, and when you go to the supermarket, all of those other kind of things, right? Do you think that there, if uh, there was a store that sold the same stuff that Nike sold, that was owned by African Americans, would, would we shop there instead of Nike? Yes, I would. Yeah, you I would. would. I would too. But as, in a general sense, do you think that that would be the case? No. I personally believe no. Why? No. Just because, like, to kind of go back into what Najee was saying, what he was kind of saying was, people don't want to see you doing better than them. Right. So us as a community, we have a hard time of seeing our people winning. And not just, like, in an instance of winning, but being better people. Mm. So if I'm the person... In the case, like you're saying, owning the, sneak, the sneaker store. Right. Before this sneaker store even gets to where I want it to be, nine times out of ten, because of the way my community is set up, I'd have had an attempt about three, maybe even not even just three, but two, three times where this store has tried to be raw. Uh -huh. And we don't look at that as the bigger picture, but it kind of is. It goes into what he's saying, where it's like we don't appreciate it until it's gone, and then we'll kind of say, "Oh, but now I want it back." But when, we, when it was there and we hmm. had it, it, it was treated like kind of nonchalantly and we picked the, the predecessors over it, like where we go into like the corner stores. We see a uh, Arabian or a Puerto Rican in the store and then we'll go right down the street and see another store which is black owned, but because these, in a the case, Puerto Ricans and, and not just, I wouldn't say indigenous people, but the people that are not native to our community, well, they are, but the community is based around African Americans. So when they kind of come in and they take up the profits that we're kind of supposed to be earning, we kind of lose traction in our money. So now it's kind of looked at as us going into the store and because you sell this for a dollar, I have to sell it for a dollar fifty now. And that was kind of pushing us back as a community instead of pushing us forward because the people that are in front of us are already taking what we have. So you're saying the prices in our community are a little higher. I mean, and, and our stores have to be a little higher than the, than the other store. Yes. And so that will, that's what causes people to go to their store because we have to sell it at a different price. Yes. And we have to sell it at a different price because people don't support us or we just like... No, no. Um, just basically, well, I learned this from personal knowledge. I just believe it's just like a form of tax invasion because we pay a dollar for this, and because it's everywhere as a dollar, when we bring it to our community, it's a dollar twenty-five. So we're making an extra little bump off profit. Well, everything that you sell, you're selling it so you can make profit, right? Yes. Right. So uh, when you buy it from a wholesaler and you sell it at a price, you're making a profit for yourself. So you're saying they're making more profit. We're trying to make more profit than everybody else is making. To, I'm just trying to be clear on what yes, you're saying. to kind of su sustain our needs in the essence. I want you to think about that and tell me, uh, you know, and I'm going to come back to you about why that's the case. Like, just think about it for a minute, about why, why you're saying that's the case. And uh, Malcolm's speech is a little different than what we're talking about, right? So when he starts talking about black nationalism, he not really getting involved in a very specific kind of cultural differences that you guys are talking about now, right? You're talking about some cultural differences that exist in our community, which speaks to the kind of nationalism Malcolm was talking about. And I'm, I'm going to uh, ask that question later, because later he said something about going to the United Nations. Did you, did you get to that part of it? We said that we should take our issues to the United Nations. Did, 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 did you hear that in the speech? It was at the end. At the end. We start saying we should take it to the United Nations. I will plead to the United Nations. Why, why did he say, why do you think he brought up the United Nations? And I'm going to come back, but I just want to put that in your mind 
so we can move the discussion a little bit. So why, why, did, he, why did he speak of the United Nations saying we should bring our case, our issues to the United Nations? Do you, do you know why? Do you know what the United Nations is? No. Okay, there, there's, a, there's an international body of nations uh, that, that meet, that come together, that convenes and deals with world issues, right? So there's a world court that's in the United Nations, right? They talk about the relationships that countries have with one another. And they're like uh, superpowers or, you know, it's interesting they call them superpowers, like superheroes. Uh, big, bigger nations that are, have more authority or, or run in, in the United Nations. But uh, many countries around the world are members of the United Nations. Uh, and you get to bring your issues to the world court. So he was, he, in his speech, he started talking about countries that did that, that brought their issues to the world court, right? They, they brought it to the United Nations to hear about the problems that was happening in their country. So right now, there might be countries that are engaging in abuse to their citizens, right? Right now, it might be a country that's engaging in abuse to the citizens and the citizens or organizations take that to the United Nations, right? And so the United Nations can make a decision about what's going on uh, uh, specifically in that country. And then sometimes the UN sends troops. You ever heard of the UN troops, the United Nations troops? They send troops to specific nations to solve problems or even deliver food or medicine or vaccine or different things like that and sometimes to engage in protecting individuals, right? is a peacekeeping force, right? United Nations have that. So that's the context. So why would Malcolm say we should bring our issues to the world court? Go ahead. Um, I feel like he said that because, well, still now, like our government is failing us. They're not behind us, they're against us. They're supposed to protect us. And they're doing the opposite. They're killing us all. So I think that's why he said that. And, and so why, why doesn't he just want to bring it to the U.S. government to solve our problems? You said why don't he? Yeah, why, what's, what's, why don't he want to bring it to the U.S. government? Because he feel like nothing really not going to be done. Like it's just going to be swept under the rug. Like they're going to make it seem like they're going to do something about it and they really not. Like it's just going to drag over and over and over. So he want to go over them to try to get some type of solution. So you got the Republicans and the Democrats. Why don't he go to the Democrats and say this is what they're doing, or the Republicans and say this is what they're doing, right? Why don't he do that? Because they know what they're doing and it's not working. Like, they see what's going on. And if they was going to do something to begin with, they would have been did it. That's why he want to go to like a higher up to get a better result. And that's what, that's what you think Malcolm was saying, that they, it doesn't work here, so we need to go to a higher body? Right. Do you think, that, do you think that's something effective? Or, or you think that, that Malcolm was mistaken in that? It's your opinion. He was probably mistaken in that because this speech was from years ago. So I'm pretty sure he would have been acted on it by now. And it's still the same things happening. So obviously that was not a good solution. So let, let, let me back up. So you saying, what, what I'm saying is, do you think Malcolm was right in saying that we should go to the United Nations? Probably at that time. Okay. Do anybody agree that it should happen now? Or you don't think that, you think we get our problems solved, you know, without going to the United Nations? Or have any problems been solved since before, not before we go to the United Nations? Go ahead. Um, personally, I feel like we could, as a community, if we come together to fix the problems, like that's really big. Um, as a community, if we come really together, it won't be as much as a problem. We could get bigger stuff done then going to the head. I think it starts here first. What's that? I think it, it starts, starts here first, first, like with us as a people. Okay. It, who agree with that? Okay. So you, 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 we, don't, we don't think that the United Nations would, would be a good move for us today? It would, but we're saying like we should start with ourselves before going to them. Okay. Okay. That's, and what would you do? I, small steps like we're doing now. Like, huh? Small steps like we're doing now. Like we're coming together right now. We're okay. having a conversation, talking about like, small steps like that. 
it'll lead to bigger steps, even if it seems like it's moving slow to begin with, because it's always going to start out slow. It's going to start picking up. Okay. Well, um, I feel like us citizens, I think we should all have a voice within ourselves, because once our voice gets to the office, they're not really listening to our voices. They're not really hearing what we have to say. So voting is really like a big thing. Like That's a big thing a part of our community, because our voices need to be heard now. We don't got to wait to them for them to give us our voices and stuff like that. We got our own voice. We got our personal beliefs. We got our own personal way how we feel. And as they say, we got justice and freedom. So we need to, they need to respect that as a community. So as citizens, we should say what we got to say before it gets to the office, because they're not really listening and respecting our voices how they should be, as they claim and as they put on TV and advertise stuff just to get the community together. No, that's not how it happened. It comes within us. Anybody want to add to that or disagree with her? Anybody disagrees with her? Not at all. Who, you agree with her? Why you agree with her? I agree with her because it, it does start within the community. I feel as though like doing what we're doing now, like as talking to you, I feel like if we do more things like this so we can try to get our point across, it will be better affected in our community. So do you think voting matters, that it's important for people to vote? Absolutely. Of course. Yeah, you, you think it's important? Do you think Malcolm was saying it was important in his speech? In some context, yes. What do you mean? I mean, Malcolm was talking about voting, yes, but the things that he, were also, he was also talking about was investing in our, in our businesses as a black community. Right. And not just investing in just saying, oh, I'm going to put this money in here. Us actually having a form of like a black Wall Street where our lives are basically being, I would, it's a word that I'm looking Secure. for, but we're flourishing as people, like as a community, as, as my peers are saying, but we're flourishing as a community instead of looking to an outlook. You wanted to help him? Well, no, I was helping him with the word that he needed. Okay. So somebody tell me why voting matters now. Why does it matter? Since all y'all jumped in, voting matters. matters now because, like, I feel like us citizens should pick and choose who we feel will be there to actually support our thoughts and our reasons. Because Donald Trump, he's not really supporting. He talk a good game in the office, but he's not really supporting our thoughts. Like I said earlier, we have the rights to say what we want. So we need a leader of the country who's going to support our thoughts and I wear liberating things and not just putting stuff on advertisements just to get people to draw in to what they gotta say. I think they should actually listen to us. A president, even though they hide in us, but the citizens count as well. We play a big part in the president's role. They should listen to us as well. So I think that's a big part of playing an own part in role. And you think voting will make people listen to us? I mean, yeah, if we choose the right president that we feel that really would serve and protect our country, of course. Okay. Anybody else want to jump in there? No? Are you all old enough to vote? Yes. Are you going to vote? Did you vote already? Did you, are you registered? Yes. yes. I, I registered, but I'm going to wait to, like, you know, go in. You're going to wait till what? To go in, you know, like. Oh, when, it's t when you yeah. actually go there and vote? Yeah. You can You can do that now. It's just a provisional ballot. But, but. Why, why are you going to vote? Maybe I'm going to put it there. If you're going to vote, why are you going to do it? Why? You, you said you're going to vote, right? Only y'all two uh, uh, voter age? Anybody else? You? You, you going to vote? OK. I want to hear what you're going to say, too. Go ahead. I believe our opinion matters, not huh? just on the political aspect, but in the case of us picking our mayors, our picking us, our, us picking our senators, it goes deeper than just same thing like with a census. It goes deeper than just the political standpoint. This is like in a case what they say with police, they're here to protect and serve us. They, in a case, they get paid to, to work for us. Right. So us as a community, we have to understand that the, 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 the political aspect to the bigger mainstream is the, the external. Where it starts at is here. If we work and tell ourselves, you know what, I'm gonna work to not just become a better person, but to enlighten everyone that's in my community. That's the basic 
assets of becoming successful, the fastest that we implement and where it goes into us being a community and where we're, we're sitting here now coming to you. Because in a few years, because in a few years, I believe that somebody sitting right here could be something like a mayor, but this is where it goes into us being a community, we have to vote. And the same thing with a senator. There's probably a senator sitting somewhere in here, but we have to vote. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I say now, like we're in a predicament where we gotta really be specific who we choose and who we vote for. Cause Donald Trump, like she was saying, how he not really benefiting us that much, and the other contest, contestant or whatever. He raised the taxes. Me and my cousin was just looking at the news, and they said he raised the taxes to 60%. So we like had to sit back and like, oh, so now how we, who we about to vote for? So like, I don't really understand how they both trying to mess us up. So who we gonna vote for? That's why I'm waiting yeah. to see who else, like what, what they got to give that's, all for us. That's good. I mean, you, you should look deeper into the people you're voting for and making sure that you're doing it for the right reasons. Uh, uh, you know, I, I wanna, we run out of time? No, we have a question that came in on the chat that okay. I'd like to uh, throw out. Is this a good time? Good. That, okay, so the question uh, that came in, uh, we, have, we have two questions that came in and these questions are um, from uh, students. I'll give you both questions. First question, why is it Black Lives Matter rather than All Lives Matter? Does that lead to further segregation and less time working together with all races? And the second question is, how can we hold our leaders accountable other than just voting? So I think the, the, first, the first question then, why is it Black Lives Matter rather than All Lives Matter? Yeah, wanna, anybody wanna tackle that? That's a good question, honestly. But in the, in the case, all lives do matter, but black lives, until black lives matter, all lives don't really matter. Because right. if I tell myself, in the case, these white lives matter, and in the case, my life doesn't matter, I can be basically brutally beaten. Somebody can walk, just walk around and basically, because they're a police officer, and like I said in my previous, me coming into this, they're here to protect and serve us, but if they're beating us in kind of, in a case going back to slavery, they're in, in, a, metaphorical, in a metaphorical way, it's, it's slaving us, kind of putting a noose around our neck and making us feel the same feeling of slavery to push us back. So my answer to that would be all lives do matter, but until black lives matter. Yeah, I wanna uh, add on, I actually think that that was a bad question because like, Black Lives Matter is not, is not the saying is being overthink. When really, we went through hell for over thousands of years now, you feel me? That shouldn't even be a question, like, should it be all lives matter or black lives matter? When we went through more than any other race could imagine, you feel me? So I don't think that was a good question, and I think black lives matter is good where it's at. Not no all lives matter. We know what, we know what it meant, like, come on, all lives do matter, duh, but black lives matter. Like, what we going through now, black lives is dropping at a rapid rate. Hey, brother. Um, like that's a valid question. That's a protest. Our protest. That's fair. And how can you say all lives matter? Black people are being blackballed in today's society. Well, it makes people feel uncomfortable, right? When you say that, and then the question becomes, why do they feel uncomfortable? That, that's the, Malcolm made a lot of people feel uncomfortable. You can see that, right? The stuff that he was saying made a lot of people feel uncomfortable. Saying that, and, and this is not even extreme to the things that Malcolm was saying, right? Malcolm was saying some very tough stuff. So if people get uncomfortable with you saying you matter, then the question you should be, the question is why? And then when you get into the, the, to the why of the question, then you figure out what the real issues are, right? Then you figure out. So I, I think you guys are right on the money. There was a, I want to go back to Malcolm talking about black nationalism. So I, I want to I go there, right? Because I think that 
uh, we, we really didn't di uh, get into it. Um, and, and, and I want to talk about it because we started talking about people we see in our community, cultural differences that we see in our community today, right? That's what we started veering off, talking about, I heard somebody say Puerto Ricans, I heard somebody say uh, something else, and I want to get into that discussion, right? Because I want us to have some clarity. It, I think it's not responsible for me to allow you to say that without me clearing it up, right? I, I want to address it, and I think it needs to be addressed in our community uh, because the stuff that Malcolm was talking about that's been affecting our community, I think the way you guys are talking and what you're saying is a symptom of the things that Malcolm was talking about, right? So I'm, I want to get into that just a tad bit. Yes? Um, like, I can refer to Malcolm because we live in a community where Jews come in and take our businesses. So like the houses that we're supposed to be owning, they come over and take it. So it's like, you, you giving back to people that was against us. So it's like, as we refer to, we don't support us blacks, it's like, we could be villagers too, but you let people come over to your part and take over your spot. So it's like, what are we doing as commun a community to let them take over what's supposed to be ours? And it's like, we getting our property knocked down because they're coming over and it's like, there is no equal rights at the end of the day. Because we living in somebody's house that didn't care about us back then, and still don't. Because you got to please somebody that never went, that looked at you, looked down on you. That used to probably be your owner, your, your grandparents, your ancestors' owners. And you sitting here still paying all this money and when y'all could work as black people to get to have your own businesses. And it's like, People don't really try as a team. Like, what I could say is me and my mom, we go down, we go down downtown, Penn Station, you know, our homeless people, we go feed them. Like I told my mom the other day, um, we could either knock down the, the abandoned houses or rebuild it. I said, we got construction in our school. People sign certificates. We could go build, we could go fix them houses, help people. I said, because I remember one time I went down there, a homeless person said he needed help, nobody wanted to help him. And I felt bad because that could have been us. Well, it was us. He was under slave owner. So it's like, get back to your community. This, I mean, you support whites and Jews, but get back to your community. Not help these people that need help because at a point in time, we didn't have nothing either, but we needed help from people too. So get back what you get. So there's two things. That's why I want to go back to that, to that discussion. There's two things I think that Malcolm was talking about here as well. You could support your community, right, without being against somebody else. You could support your community without being against somebody else, right? You, and, and I think the, the concept of black nationalism with this brother, what's your name again? Zakur. Zakur. Was, was, was getting at was how do we create our own businesses, how do we begin to develop our own community? How do we get to support those things? And then some of you guys hit on it too, and this brother too, how do we support that? And what's stopping us from supporting our own businesses as opposed to other people's businesses, right? What's, what's responsible? What's, what do you do to make sure your community is thriving, right? That you make a choice with your money, you make a choice with your actions, you make a choice when you go to the store, you're making a choice. You're making a conscious choice, right? When you buy something, you're making a choice, right? When you go get a bowl, a box of cereal from the supermarket, you're making a choice of what cereal you want to uh, support versus another cereal, right? Based on what you like, right? You're making a choice. So when you go to the store, you make a choice. I think Malcolm was talking about choosing yourself. Disagree with that? No. Huh? No. Okay. He, he, that, 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 we choose, that you're choosing yourself. But I think you can do that without... I, you know, being against other people, or identifying other people as being, uh, you know, a problem for you, like uh, the, the young lady uh, was saying over there. Go ahead. It's not like we against people. It's like we feel like people are against us. Right. And it's like you, you don't even know us. You just judge just by our skin tone. Right. And it's like that's what people say. What about all lives? But what about our lives? We can't judge by our color every day. Like we read in school about um, should we 
protest peacefully or violently. Right. I feel like when we when we protest violent, y'all look at us like, oh, we crazy and stuff. When we protest with signs and words, we don't get hurt. We get abused. We get knocked down. So it's like, what y'all want us to be? You want us to be calm or rowdy? Right. That's that's. Anybody agree with what she's saying? Yes. I agree. agree with Good. It. Anybody want to add on to it? Good. I agree with what she's saying because say like we like the protest we had downtown, like that was a peaceful protest, but I don't feel as though like everybody's voice was heard. But then like going back to like how we had talked about in school, or do a peaceful protest or do a violent protest, I feel as though. A violent protest isn't safe because we'll, we'll like be messing up our own community. Like the state of New York, how they rise to all of yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. With Sabrina over here, it wouldn't have been helpful because we would have been messing up our own black communities and stores that we have around the area. I agree to both. I agree to like what both of them said because like when she talking about how Newark was doing peaceful, yeah, they was doing peaceful. But if you look at Minneapolis, they was over the top. They was burning down buildings. And if you look at that, you actually taking homes away from families that could be in need. You taking jobs away from people that need to feed their families. You gotta think about stuff like that. So when you ask that, I thought of it like a pro and con situation. It's like, it could be two answers. Me, I really think that peaceful protesting is right. But at the same time, I agree with what she said. Cause like, as we peaceful protest, we not being heard. But as soon as we act in violence, oh, we wanna make the news or we doing this, we doing that. And that's when justice, comes in a type of manner. Like it wants to slowly comes our way when we doing violence. And I don't understand that. We could we could we could be here right now, talk to the mayor, right? And everybody over the world over the world might see this. They might be like, yeah, them just black kids. And don't even watch it. Don't even hear what we're saying. So it's like we really don't be heard. Still as us being young, we still don't be heard. Well, I want to tell you two things in history just to think about, because I don't want to, I'm not trying to, you know, I'm trying to guide you. So you make up your own mind, but I want to guide you, right? So it's one of the two specific things. So do you know the year the March on Washington took place? Hey, what's his name? What's the March on Washington. The March on Washington? Yeah. I don't know the exact year. You know what I'm talking about? The March on Washington, Martin Luther King, they always before. talk to us about it in school, da 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 da. Probably the only thing we learn about. I heard about it. Right? So do you, do, it was 60 what? One, two, three, you know, four? I think you think it was 1963? I'm not too sure. Nineteen sixty three, be confident. After the March on Washington, there are two specific things that happened in this country that's very, very important, right? Very, very important. The, the, the public accommodations or the Civil Rights Bill was passed in 1964, right? Which basically destroyed segregation or Jim Crow in the South. Not, not factual segregation, because we still segregate it, but legal segregation, like nobody can't segregate you legally, right? At least places that are getting government funding. How about that? Um, 1965, the Voting Rights Act, which is really was uh, focusing on states that made these rules up. So when you go vote, which is a problem today, when you go vote, they made up things uh, that stop you from voting, like poll taxes, right, or, liter or literacy tests. So you go vote. You have to take a literacy test. And they ask you, you know, name the 50 presidents of the United States or some crazy question like that. That has nothing to do with your literacy, but has to do with your, your memory and your understanding of that. And then you don't pass it and you don't get to vote, right? So it dismantled all of that. You know, Donald Trump was the first president to be elected uh, since the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Uh, where the Voting Rights Act was dismantled, right? It's, he's, he's been the first president since the dismantling, I should say, of the Voting Rights Act, right? Since, since, since it was knocked down, he's the first president that become president after they've dismantled the Voting Rights Act. So that's something just for you to think about. And don't listen to what I'm saying, right? Go 
read about it and get the information yourself. Go to the North Public Library on virtual and you can check it out on the virtual North Public Library stuff. Go ahead. Right. Yep. And it's difficult when nobody taught you how to read, right? When it was illegal for you to go to school, all these other kind of things. So obviously, but the, but the literacy test wasn't even that advanced, wasn't even that simple, right? You, they didn't tell you, here's a book, read it. It was more like, can you tell me the 50 presidents of the United States or the, every capital of all the states in the, in the union or, you know, or all kind of crazy questions like that that tried to deal with your literacy. And some people uh, simply couldn't read. So it made it difficult. And, and today, the Voting Rights Act is, is broken. They, they tore it down. So a lot of states, immediately after it was gone, began to put in things that made it difficult for people to vote and begin to uh, you know, purge voter lists. So go check that out, right? Look at, you could, you could even Google, uh, um, you know, you just type in voter suppression or Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act and it'll give you a whole bunch of articles that you can read so you can be clear on what's actually happening today versus what happened then. So there are, and I brought that up to just say that there have been times in history that mass protests and mass organization caused immediate change, right? Who knew there was a rebellion in Newark? Like there was a, that, that stuff happened that you see all over the country, that it happened in Newark at one time? You knew that? Like the stuff you see burning everywhere, they say everywhere's burning. You know Newark, that happened in Newark? You say yeah, do you know what year that was? No. 1967. Mm, okay. 1967, right? Uh, 26, I believe, people uh, were killed. 26. You know, you used to, you used to go Springfield Avenue, was a shopping district, like downtown, right? And you see, you see Springfield Avenue now from Blum, 10th Street, all the way down to where the where new community is. And it took us, how long do you think that mall been there that we just got, the supermarket and all the other stuff? That's a nice looking spot though, right? The, mall, the, the supermarket and all that. How long do you think that that's been there? That supermarket, the McDonald's, all that stuff, how long do you think it's been there, huh? Years, right? 10 years? Four, five nah. years. About five years. Five. About five years. Exactly. Before that, it used to be what? A lot. A lot. A vacant lot. Do you, do, you, do you remember in your mind what it was before that? It was like mad, like rocks and stuff. So any, do you remember any building that was there oh, in no. your lifetime? Guess what? I don't remember either. I'm older than you. That means it's been like that for what? A long time. Long time. And that's how long it took us to come back at least a little bit from that. Five years. That's the only that's as long as that's been there. Five years. So we and we and we still got a lot more to do on that block. Ain't that right? The bank just came down, all that stuff up and down the road. We're still trying to develop that, right? Still recovering from that. So I just want to put that in your mind as well. Just, just want to put it in your mind. Do you think in Malcolm's speech, he was talking, we get into a lot of ethnicities, right? Malcolm was basically talking about black people and what? The white people. The white man. Yeah, he was talking about white people, black people and white people. That's what he was talking about. Very, very general in those terms, right? Yes. That's what he was talking about in those terms. Uh, 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 in those terms, and it probably was like that in those terms because of what was happening at the time, right? Very, very specific that he was talking about. Um, and he talked about um, um, the ballot or the bullet. What does the ballot or the bullet mean in your mind? What does that mean in your mind? The ballot or the bullet. That's a heck of a title to put on a speech, right? All right, so um, last night, just, just, just off personal, um, last night I was watching a video 
about um, the ballad of the bullet. And Malcolm X made a good point. He said, Mar Marcus Garvey said this. He said, it's the same thing as liberation or death. Basically saying, free freedom or the bullet. You think that's what he was saying? Yeah? Why you think that? Because, like, what he mean by bullet is, like, it's death. Like, we either going to get our freedom or we going to fight for what we going to get. Anybody else? Basically, he's saying, like, get it by any means necessary. Get it by any means necessary. So whatever you got to do to get the job done, do it. But is he telling you? Go ahead, brother. Go ahead. I don't want to jump you. Go ahead. You mean, like, either vote, like, either you're going to vote and we're going to get our freedom or it's going to turn into something else and it's going to become violent. Or, or it may become violent. Or it may become violent, right? Do you think there's violence out here now? It's a whole lot of violence. It's a whole lot. Like what? What's the violence that's going on? That kids you see? Killing, each killing each other. Huh? Kids killing each other. And, and political violence, the stuff that you see that, that's, that's going on. The, the, uh, I'm going to get into it. I'm going to end with the us killing each other thing. But do you see any violence that's happening around the country? Is, is it violence happening around the country now based on inequality and people not getting their rights and all this stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Like the George Floyd. Like George Floyd and everything that happened as a result of that. Anything else? Breonna Taylor. Breonna Taylor might be one, right? Amal Arbery. Okay, Amal Arbery. That's right, right? So, and, and the response to that has been, has it been, peace, has it been a peaceful response to that? No. In some instances, but, but basically, no. It's been really, really violent, right? It's been really violent. So e either we're going to get change or things are going to get worse. Yeah. Or, or things are going to get worse. Is that what you think? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, I want to end talking about us, period, because we get into the nationals. I want to talk about us, right? I want to talk about nobody else. I want to end talking about us, right, and the things that we see in our community, right? What are the negative things that you see in your community? Yes. Okay, I live in Newark where there'd be a lot of stolen cars. Like my mom, well, my sister and my brother car just got hit. they come 8 in the morning, just riding around, hitting cars. Like, okay. what do you do? Like, what's the point of that? Okay, who's, who's the victims of that? Us, because we got to get our car fixed. How are we getting to work? How are we getting there? Okay. Any, any other thing that you see that's happening in your community? I see a lot of homeless people, and I feel as though, like, we could find, like, different programs and ways to help them. Like, I wouldn't suggest, like, giving money to them. I feel as though they just want a path where they can, like, you know. Like, come find support? Yeah. Okay. So, like, they can have help to change your lifestyle and all that. Like, I don't feel as though, like, money is nothing. I just feel as like they just want help in, like, different ways and programs they can join yeah. to get themselves together or stop taking drugs or stuff like that. Can, can no. I add on? Yeah, you can. Like, as a school, we, we clean up our community. And that's, that's just us. As a, that's just us. Like, and I feel like my school, these students I'll be around, I know that they are willing to do stuff like that. And I feel like the our community should too. Right. So it's like we could work as a team, get a couple people out here and there, just get them toothbrush, yeah. certain little things. Dollar Tree got toothbrush, help 100%. people out. Cause you now, what if you was down like them? You would want somebody to support you, help you, feed you, give you comfort. It's getting cold. Right. They old. They need comfort. They need heat. Um, Any of you guys, what do you think? Things that are happening in our community that's we victimizing each other. Go ahead. Ask that question again. We victim it, things that's happening in our community where you believe that we are the victims, that we're victimizing each other. Um, I feel like holding back resources. Like you might know something that can help somebody else, but you just holding back because you don't want to pay everybody onto it. Yeah. Like that, that's a big thing for me. Okay. Um, people I, hoarding stuff for themselves. Yeah, that's that's a big one. But as in like things that we need as a community, I feel as though like we need um, things to put our time into. Because I mean, we all got spare time. And, um, 
time to time. So I think when you bull, you do bad things. Idle time is the devil's play. So I feel like we need more activities, more mentors, and people that we could talk to, not just about like politics and things that's going around the neighborhood, like real personal stuff. You could really right. talk to somebody they can really relate to. You. Right. We need stuff like big mentorship brother, programs. Yeah, mentorship programs. More activities, not just for us, but little kids that's younger than us too, and yeah. kids that's our age too. We just need more activities and stuff to do, like right now. Okay. And I got, feel like those like there is programs out there, but don't nobody know about them. Yeah, like holding back resources. That goes back to holding back resources. That's, that's, that's what this brother said. Yeah. 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 I feel as though like, and we got a lot of like people that's talented and people that don't know they're talented. So we need programs like where you can find your purpose, because that's a big thing in life. Because yeah. if you're not even living, like, what's the the purpose to live. So right. I feel like we need the programs yeah. like that and like sports programs because a lot of people good at sports. Like besides high school sports, we need like recreation, like stuff we could do on the side, like seven, seven. For sure. With regular people like me, like you not really you don't play for high school no much, you just want to play sports. I mean, stuff like yeah. that. Uh, I feel as though like some people from my experience, like I've seen people that was in North playing for schools and they was really nice. They could have went far, but they have fell like to the trap, to the streets. All, all cause one of their homies died and they want to get paid back, getting locked up. No, their whole career is gone. Because like they got chance. pulled into the streets. Yeah, yeah pulled yeah. into it. They, they, they start trapping. <laughs> That's, it's interesting that it's called the trap, right? Yeah. I, I apologize, but I, but I want to piggyback off what Go ahead. Just saying. We was just having a conversation maybe 30 minutes prior before you came in about the same topic, which is the trap. That's right. You taking a risk, but really thinking about it. When you think about it, and my point, what I wanted to go into was just us poisoning the community, but now we talking about this. And I no, that's this, right. Go, go into what you this, was gonna go into. This is like, it's a real, a real primitive problem. It's, a, it's the problem of, like in the case where Malcolm X was talking about, the ballot or the bullet, because in the case, that's the, that we might not understand it, but that's the bullet. When we, when we decide to take the trap and then we get mad because we trapped ourselves. It's no taking risks, it's just a mouse trap. If you get caught in a mouse trap, there's no getting out. You're done. Well, mice try to avoid traps, right? Mm -hmm. we, we, we walking into them. And, mm -hmm. <laughs> anybody else wanna, wanna add to that? I wanna tell you about a, a story, uh, real life, and uh, try to bring us to some semblance, two things actually. The first one is two psychologists, right? Kenneth and Mamie Clark, right? You should, New Republic Library, Kenneth and Mamie Clark. Google Kenneth and Mamie Clark, right? Who heard of Brown versus Board of Education? Brown versus Board of Education, right? Brown, Brown versus Board of Education helped us do what to schools? Desegregate schools. That's right, desegregate schools, 100%. 1954, desegregate schools. That's what it is. Even though schools are still segregated, it, you think your school segregated? My school is personally not segregated. Okay, what school you go to? I go to Lee Charter School. Okay. When you say it's not segregated, what's the majority of the people in the school? African American. What's the percentage of it? If I'm not mistaken, we cover about 50%, maybe even more. Okay, what's the other percent? The other percent would be something Latino, if okay. not Latino, just How many white people go to your school? How many white people go to your school? Zero, maybe one percent. Right. So it's still segregated. The, um, so Brown versus Board of Education was supposed to desegregate schools. They won the case because they used a study that was done by Kenneth and Mamie Clark called the doll study. You heard of the doll study? Yeah. You heard of the doll study? Tell me about it. Uh, basically, like, he's putting dolls in front of kids or whatever. That's what you're talking about, right? When they was putting dolls in front of the kids? Yeah, absolutely. All right, so basically, they was putting the dolls in front of the kids, and one doll was white, and the other one was black, and they was basically asking them, all right, which one you want? And all the black kids was picking a white one. Yes, but it gets deeper than that. So they were picking a white doll, but they also asked them which doll was ugly. They asked them which doll was ugly. And what doll did they pick? The black one. 
Well, of course. Deeper than that, they said, which doll was bad? Bad. And which doll did they pick? Black one. Now, here's the, then it goes even deeper. It goes deep. We're going even further down. Which doll... No, no, let, before I go all the way down, one more level, one more level. Which doll do you prefer to play with? The, the little girls. And which one did they pick? Black one. Which one they would prefer to play with? Oh, the white girl. They white preferred one. to play with the white doll. Now, here's, here's, the, here's, here's, the, here's, the, here's all the way at the bottom. Which doll looks like you? The black doll. So they were clear that the black doll looked like them, right? But they also said the black doll was what? Ugly. And what else? Bad. Bad. So they internalized hatred. They internalized hatred, right? Is, is, am I wrong? Am I saying something wrong? No. You, who disagrees with me? Do you think that that's relevant today? Do we internalize hatred today? Yes. yes. People still racist. Like, um... Go. Go ahead. Like, I feel what you're saying, like, internalizing, like, you feel like hatred towards yourself and you don't even know it. Like, um, girls want to look like somebody else, like they, like they see on TV, like, oh, this black girl ugly, let me look like the white girl, put makeup on, cover how I really look, and look lighter. Like, yeah. That's really happening, and it's not, they're not doing it. They're doing it, like, not realizing what they're doing. Subconsciously. Subconsciously, right. Um, I also feel like, it's not even just being about races. It's how our community and our environment is molding us young people. If we hearing we bad or we this, we that, we're going to take that in. It's like, that's more like a mental problem. It's like what you hear around is what you're going to grow up off. So it's like, that's, that's really taking, right. like, as we grow up, we molding as we think, oh, black people ain't going to be nothing, this, that, and the third. And white people, they grow up, they're going to be doctors and stuff like that. They hearing better environment than how we hearing. So I don't think it's like a racist part is more like how a young people is growing up and being moved inside of the community. So they made a relationship between the feeling that we ha that these kids had towards themselves to education and segregated educational systems that taught people specifically different things and allowed them to see themselves differently in society, right? And that that was causing a kind of psychological self-hatred, right? And so segregated schools had to be dissolved because there's a sense of inferiority that people get in a society that tells them black is bad. Good. Yeah, I was just gonna say like, we've been brainwashed, like we basically programmed and we don't know it. And so black also gets to be color like the actual color, like darker versus light. And that happens in all of our communities, right? So that, it, it even permeates all the way down there. And I think that that's some of the stuff that Malcolm was talking about with nationalism, right? Trying to bring everybody together that's in that spectrum. And guess who else is in that spectrum? Puerto Ricans. Who? Puerto Ricans. Dominican, they all black, yeah. they all black. You said that, not me. That's the difference between where we started and where we ended, right? Right? They're also in that spectrum. Yeah, they, they face the same problems we do. Not all, but most. It's because yeah. our community, they, they're here with us. Right. What, what language do you speak? English. English. Uh, you from England? No. H how you get to speak English? Learn. Huh? Learn. But why you speak English? Why you don't speak French? Why wasn't you born speaking Spanish? They basically say we learn English. Huh? From the, they say we learn English from the British. You said what? They say we learn English from the British, but I don't believe that. From, you learn English from the British? Mm -hmm. It's American history, right? Check that out. Why, why do Puerto Ricans speak Spanish? Because, well, not, I can't speak for Puerto Ricans, but like, Puerto Rican, I could speak for Puerto Dominicans. Ricans, listen, like, are Puerto Ricans from Spain? No, that's just the language they speak. Yeah. They, they something was, else that y'all need to, to get into further. They was enslaved by people from Spain. That's why they speak Spanish. Say that again? They was enslaved by people from Spain. That's why they speak Spanish. And in, in America, the people who enslaved 
who dominated in America spoke what? English. English. Huh? English. 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 People who took over spoke English. Yes, yeah, people took over, right, spoke English. That's right. So I just want you to be clear on that. I wanted to come back to that because I heard that and y'all came back to it without me coming, telling you, you came back to it on your own uh, because you, you, you know it already. You know it already. I, just, I don't want you to be confused. I want you to understand where you are because when Malcolm was talking about nationalism, there's a lot of people that can fit in that. Right, there's a lot of people that can fit in that. And I don't want you to exclude them. I don't want you to exclude them, right? And then, I mean, let's, let's end with this part. Do you agree with everything that was said in the ballot or the bullet? Let's start there. Let me end right there. Do you agree with everything that was said? It's okay if you agree or disagree. It's not my job to tell you to agree or disagree. It's my job yeah, to make sure you're clear. I'm, I agree, but I don't necessarily necessarily agree with everything that he kind of promoted. Okay. Which was saying the understanding of community building, us having economic and social, not even just inequity, but just having that, that principle installed in the brain where if this is my brother, no matter if it's my blood or not, if I'm looking to help you, then if I'm helping you, we can help him. Right. Where it goes into where he started, like, basically calling the white man Uncle Tom. B -b calling the white man Uncle Tom and basing his opinion on basically how he needed to take us back to um, the primitive land. And then he started going into basically, like, um, the, the great Elijah Muhammad, what Elijah Muhammad was speaking on. That, that's where he kind of lost me at. But the, the basis of the ballot and the bullet and voting and, like I said, being like the community, the economic, the social, and basically like just spiritual, the same thing that we learned in our philosophy, the same thing that we just said to you. Yeah. It's, it's basically, in a case, I wouldn't say it's, it's contradiction from what he's saying, but when he started going into talking about the Uncle Toms and things like that, it kind of made it feel like, all right, this is not the community aspect that we're having a conversation about now. Okay, I get what you're saying. He was saying come together, but was attacking some leaders at the same time. Okay, that's a, that's a good point. Anybody, anybody else? One more, no more? Y'all brilliant kids, you know that, right? You guys are sharp. You need, you need to get some more, you know, get information, but guess what? Your generation has access to more information than any other generation in the history of this planet. And you got access to it in multiple languages. You can put up an article and push translate, and it'll translate it for you. You ever check that out? That bugs me out on the computer. I get on a computer, like I said, say push translate, and they translate for me. I grew up in the, in the time period, we didn't have all this stuff. I, I had Walkmans, I didn't have all that other kind of stuff you guys got. I had to put a cassette tape in and push a button. Y'all got all kind of stuff going on, man. You know, I'm taking advantage of it. I want to tell you a last story about a trap, because that's what you talked about, and I want to tell you this, and I'm not going to, elaborate enough and I just want to tell you this story and then I want to get out of here because I got to go somewhere else, right? Is this guy, he's a speaker. His name is Amari Yetzatelli, right? Uh, he was given a speech and he talked about hunters in the Arctic, right? And how they hunt wolves in the Arctic, right? Wolves are dangerous animals, right? So how they hunt wolves. So what they did was they use a double-edged sword. They use a double-edged sword. And they take one part of the, the blade and they stick it in the ice. They stick it in the ice. And they leave the other part of the blade protruding out of the ice, right? Then they put blood on the blade. They put blood on the blade. And the wolf, when he gets hungry, smells the blood, right? And so the wolf, in smelling the blood, goes to the blade, and he starts licking the blade. He starts licking the blade. So while he's licking the blade, licking the blood, he's cutting his tongue, right? So at some point, he begins to drink his own blood, because he's licking and licking and licking, and he's bleeding and bleeding and licking. And then ultimately, he dies. He kills himself, right? So the hunter actually uses what the wolf desires or needs 
to, kill to entrap them to kill them. The wolf, right? Just something that you should listen to. You know, get, get you to think about before we walk out of here, you know what I mean? Get you to think about, add that to them. And read the autobiography of Malcolm X. It'll give you a better understanding of what, of what Malcolm was talking about when he was talking about the battle of the bullet. And more important, why he was talking about it. That's always the most important question. Why? It's the most, why leaves you the more wise, the more wise, the more wise, the more wise, and the more you answer these whys, the more brilliant you become. Because why gives you the foundation of what people are saying and, 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 and what they're doing. You, you get an understanding of it. Always ask why. So I thank you all, man. You helped me out more than you helped yourselves, I think. So God bless y'all. Have a great day. Thank you, Mayor.